and um, my presentation will be about embodiment and um, the dimensions of space time, gravity and attachment. Um, and I've put up front these two um, um, proverbs. Um, second one is of Karl Jaspers. Um, the transformation of will into bodily movement is the only place in the world where the magical becomes real. Let's start with Malo Ponti. It's always good to start with him because he was um, saying um, that what light is for seeing, body movement is for feeling. So he gave body movement a very um, special place. And he also said that the living body is the place where man is anchored in the world. And thus it's the starting point of our coordinate system. So today I'm gonna to talk about the dimensions of space from that starting point of our coordinate system, our body, um, the dimension of time, the dimension of gravity and the dimension of the other or the relational dimension. Um, let's start with space. So um, the idea uh, behind um, a research field that's called spatial bias. It's coming from social psychology um, and it's um, preoccupied with um, dimensional movement and the related meaning. The idea is actually also to be found in philosophy um, with Ernst Cassira, who wrote in the psychology of symbolic forms in, in 1925, only because we are body, we have space. And the main spatial directions, uh, front, back, up, down, left, right, in visual as well as in haptic space are concordantly in equivalent. And he means in equivalent in meaning. So each, each, each spatial direction has their um, meaning, their corresponding meaning um, dimension. He also says the main directions are not interchangeable because each of these directions is coupled to specific organ sensations. Each of these has a specific feeling value tied to it. So um, this is beginning of last century. And now in contemporary research, for example, Barbara Tversky's research at the University of Stanford in um, the United States, um, she is also finding that the body is actually the point that lays the ground for the spatial um, directions. And then the spatial directions and space is actually the ground for us to form our concepts and um, express them in language. So this is a summary slide um, of all the different empirical results that have been found in this spatial bias um, area of research about movement directions and meaning, um, which also, of course, um, lays the ground for metaphorical movement. Um, so it's also very much tied to movement metaphors and the theory of Lakoff and Johnson. Um, so the body um, has been found and movement directions have been found in empirical research for the up direction that it's connected to power and success. These experiments have been done with um, Stroop tasks mainly. So they are often laboratory experiments, but there are also a couple of uh, field experiments that I will point out. So the dimension of moving upwards is connected to power and success. Moving downward is connected to subordination and defeat, but also to sadness and helplessness. So the feeling, the emotional dimension Whereas moving upward is connected to the happy feelings and the good feelings. So also an evaluation dimension where the good is more up and the bad is more down. So this is about this um, first axis, um, the vertical axis, which is actually the second axis, we'll come to that. And then we have the sagittal movement axis. So we can move to the front and we can move to the back. And this moving to the front is related to the future and moving to the back is more or less related to the past. And uh, this is very interesting because um, we have research that shows that this is not um, universally the same. So it's um, interculturally different. There are cultures um, that actually live with the past in front of them and the future in their back. 
we have a beautiful research by Rafa Nunez. Um, he's Chilean, by the way, um, who did um, a study, um, not only experimental studies, but also gesture analyses um, around this phenomenon of the future and the past and the satchel dimension. And he found in um, an Indian culture in the north of Chile, that when he looked at the gestures there as compared to Westerners gesturing, that people would gesture the other way around. So whereas a Westerner would say next year and gesture to the front, can you see me? Um, and say last year and gesture to the back. Um, in that culture, um, people were gesturing to the back when they said next year, and they were gesturing to the front when they said last year. So he actually said they are living with their ancestors, facing their ancestors, and the future is actually moving this way for them. So um, we also have um, hints that this is true for um, places in China with the research of Lyra Boroditsky. So this is very interesting because whereas the vertical movement dimension seems to be quite universal, the sagittal movement dimension is more uh, culture bound. And um, we also have um, evidence that in Western cultures, the movement direction of moving back is related to being undecided, to being more introvert, to being more controlled, whereas moving to the front is more related to being extrovert, being decided. And also, again, we have this um, evaluation dimension where moving to the front is more positively connotated and moving to the back is more negatively connotated in the Western world. And then we have evidence from other research studies um, about the horizontal movement dimension. So that's moving left to right in this way, which is actually the first movement dimension that we acquire in the course of our lives. And um, we have long thought that there was no bias there, but there is. there are two types of biases, the natural bias, which is connected to our handedness, um, where the, um, dominant hand is connoted more positively than the non-dominant hand. Also, there are cultural phenomena, of course, because um, in white places in Africa, you are eating with your right hand and you're going to the toilet with your left hand. So there's a big evaluative bias just due to the use of the hands, for example. And then we have a cultural bias with the horizontal dimension where it's about riding directions. In the Western world, where we ride from right uh, from left to right, we basically project the future also in the right direction, and um, we project the past on the other side. But in uh, cultures where you ride from right to left, there you would project the future into the other side. Um, and Anna Maas has been doing very interesting studies with Arabs and um, Ital Italians and Arabs living in Italy for a control group that is in the middle somewhere. And she found uh, that uh, bias of the future being in the in the represented in the writing direction, and this also has um, interesting implications. For example, in the realm of um, advertisement, where in the Arab countries uh, they try to implement um, uh, washing powder advert advertisement, um, advertising the washing powder the um, dirty washing on the uh, left-hand side and then the washing powder in the middle and then the clean washing on the right-hand side. And nobody would buy that uh, washing powder in the Arab world because of course you needed to put the two washing uh, staples in the different uh, replacement in order for them to, to not make it look that your washing in the end is dirty when you are actually taking it out of the washing machine, right? So this is um, very interesting with the spatial bias. So we learned that all these movement directions, moving up, breathing in, bulging the chest are, is related to, for example, bride. We have Charles Darwin who has been beautifully describing this already in his book, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. Um, so here's the research, the empirical research for it. And it's very interesting what we learn about embodiment and how the body is actually the ground for metaphors and for language in the end. Um, what we also see when we compare this to um, linguistic research um, of the last century, we know that Oscar Tsushi and Tannenbaum were doing their semantic differential work where they were trying to find out underlying meaning dimensions of all languages in the world. 
Um, they were doing this with factor analyses and using all the um, dictionaries they could find and all the adjectives in the dictionary. So they had hundreds and thousands of, um, of adjectives and they came up with three dimensions of meaning, which is the evaluation dimension, which is good versus bad or um, comfortable versus uncomfortable, all these words. And then they found as a second um, dimension, the potency dimension, which is dominant versus, for example, um, submissive and um, 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 powerful versus powerless. Um, and they found the action dimension, which is the third dimension of the adjectives. And the action dimension can be related to the sagittal. So we could relate these meaning dimensions that they found in language with the meaning dimensions of the body. And that could give us a hint that our language is actually based on our embodiment in the world. And um, so there, seem, there, there, there are several hints from these researches that the body is the base also for concepts, language, and um, the other cultural acquirements. Um, but this is not; these are not the only dimensions. And also, you know, there are um, phenomenologists such as Erwin Strauss who said that when the body is in movement and is dynamic, that then we need to look whether these dimensions can still be found um, because something else is happening when you go into a dynamic with the body. Um, and also um, there is a more basic dimension um, in terms of movement directions and the body and it's the dimension of moving inward and moving outward. Um, so inside of the body and out of the body which is actually before, developmentally before, you know, moving in any directions in space. Can you all understand me well? Okay, good. Um, so Thomas Fuchs was putting forth a taxonomy and he said, these two dimensions moving into the body and out of the body are really important on the basis. And um, a couple of other um, people have looked at that um, as well. And he calls them centrifugal body directions and centripetal body directions. And the centrifugal ones are the ones that are expansive, expulsive, explosive, emanative, and so forth. And the centripetal ones are the reflexive, the retentive, the repulsive, the receptive um, qualities. So. And it's gonna be really interesting to look at, you know, I mean, I'm just, I, let me go back. A um, <laughs> Couple of people are doing very interesting research um, with language and words that go or move from the inside of your, um, of this part of your body to the outside or the other way around because there are vowels that are more up front and there are vowels that are more back there. Very interesting, Sasha Topolinsky, if you want to check that out. And, um, also, I'm, I have your name here, Maria Isabel, because you had the idea to use the inside and out of the body with eating disorder and looking at eating disorder in a different way with a phenomenological theory in the background. And I think that's a very, very good idea um, because it could be a really useful theory in order to get further with helping the eating disorder patients. All right. So let's look at time. Time is the next dimension I wanted to talk about. So time. Um, so this is just another slide to point out that Thomas Fuchs has been looking at the psychopathology of time. And I think and I hope that he's going to talk about this in his presentation just in just a few moments. But um, let me talk a little bit more about coming from um, maybe what Maxine Sheets Johnson is telling us in her 1999 book, that our world of experiences does not consist of object, but of dynamics and changes. So all the time we're experiencing these qualities in our surroundings. And um, they are of course, um, closely related to time. And she says, mother, uh, movement is indeed the mother of all cognition. That's um, her quoting Husserl. It forms the eye that moves before the eye that moves forms movement. So it's a very early thing. And there's all these dynamics that also um, um, Daniel Stern has been talking um, in his vitality dynamics um, that he's been putting forth. So there, you could say that there is intrasubjective time 
Um, so in within our own bodies, there are rhythms and rhythm synchronization within our own bodies. Um, you could also call that a certain self-synchrony. So when I talk, I also gesture with my talk and I make the pauses at the moment or I finish or um, I'm, um, I'm pausing with my talk and my gesturing goes on in order to indicate some other word that might come up. So there's a certain self-synchrony and rhythms that we use within our body. And then there's also intersubjective time. Um, so there's a certain coordination with other bodies um, in interpersonal rhythms, interpersonal rhythm synchronization, interactional synchrony, um, and uh, so forth. So this is um, a movement system I'm going to talk briefly about. It's called the Kestenberg Movement Profile. And it tells us about these movement rhythms that develop from within the womb when we are not yet born um, and that indicate um, certain needs and certain um, affects um, from ourselves that we have in our bodies. And, um, you know, when um, if the caregiver is sensitive to these needs, of course, there can be a very successful communication between a small child that can't speak yet and is expressing themselves in these movement rhythms. And um, so, yes, this is uh, Judith Kestenberg who said, there are all these dynamics going on. There are all these adjectives um, and um, children may be more low or more high intensity with their rhythms. They may be more gradual or more abrupt with their rhythms. Um, and Stern is actually echoing this in his 2012 book um, where he talks about um, vitality effects and he says this is the timeline and this is the intensity of the movement and we can actually write these movement qualities that we experience in this way with these graphs um, um, that uh, Judith Kestenberg has al already been talking about in the 50s of the last century. So this is really good. We know now that there's a way to also visualize and talk about these qualities that we may experience in, or that we all experience in these, particularly when we're not yet having language, but of course also ongoing when we have acquired language. So this is Judith Kessberg, this is her system and the rhythm system is only one of nine actually profiles how we look at movement in the system. So there are other very interesting um, dimensions of how we look at movement in the system. I can't go into those and don't make me go into those because I'm gonna talk forever. I can talk about this for hours. So um, just to let you know the basic dimensions that she conceptualizes is the qualities of movement and the rhythms belong to the qualities of movement and it's more in the interpersonal system. And then the movement shape and the movement shape um, is on the other side of the system on here on the right hand side with uh, four of the perspectives. And that's more about how we connect to our environment, to objects in the environment, but particularly also to people in the environment, of course. <clears throat> And that's starting from the breath with growing and shrinking towards other people or away from other people in our movements with subtle movements, but also with um, um, more explicit movements. This is a rhythms curve of a newborn baby where you can keep, you know, in time. So you have a timeline, you make a timeline, you use your hand to write the tension flow changes in the body of the observed child. So you're using yourself basically like a seismograph would actually measure, you know, a trembling earth. You're using yourself in that way, using your kinesthetic empathy with the body that's moving in front of you. And then bringing these lines down on the sheet of paper and then identifying patterns that are actually coming up from the body movement of, in this case, a small baby of two and a half months. Yeah, so these are the prototypical rhythms. And I just wanted to point out, I'm not going too much into them, but it's very interesting. So just the oral rhythms, for example, are used 
Um, when you hug somebody, um, you might want to you start with the aura rhythm maybe, and then when the hug is getting coming to an end, you might change it into the fighting phase of that rhythm, which is the biting rhythm, in order for the other person to let them know that you are actually wanting to separate from them. So that's just um, just as an example of how rich these rhythms are and what they are all tell us about our communication with others on the nonverbal um, area. Um, there are songs that you can directly connect to these um, rhythms. For example, all the lullabies all over the world are in an oral rhythm so that they actually calm down the kids. Um, they have this very sinus curve like um, very um, frequent uh, pattern. And um, okay, um, and also in art, you can find these rhythms. For example, Van Gogh has uh, a lot of twisting rhythm in his uh, paintings, and that, of course, is also expressing needs. And we have been looking at the communicative power of these rhythms. Um, so we have been doing experiments with um, communication in these rhythms with a handshake, within a handshake. Um, so we had somebody who was trained to shake the hand either in a rhythm that is smooth or that has sharp reversals. And then we found out that people would interpret these um, handshakes in totally different ways. And um, so they found uh, smooth rhythms were found to indicate more positive effect, but also in terms of personality of the person, more agreeableness, more openness and more extraversion whereas the sharp rhythms were related to um, a more negative affect and also a higher perceived neuroticism in the person that was shaking the hand. And we also worked with embraces. Um, so I was already saying, when you start to embrace somebody, you use a smooth rhythm. When you, when you wanna indicate you wanna separate, you use a sharp rhythm. And we were looking at that experimentally, um, trying to find out whether this theory of Kastenberg is actually um, observable. So we first did observations in train stations and in our Commodores, in our, uh, where the students eat. Um, of you know people saying goodbye and it was very interesting because already in these field observations we found out that it was also a big gender questions around the hugs um, so the smooth phase um, would be there when two women would hug and when a woman and a man would hug but it wouldn't be there when two men were actually hugging. So they would start right away with the padding phase, with the sharp rhythm phase, and wouldn't go into the smooth rhythm space. So that was interesting in and of itself. Also really telling in terms of the homophobia that's still around in our society, um, pretty much. So, yes. Oh. And the next dimension, I'm coming to the next dimension, that's gravity. Now, gravity is about I, myself, and me. And that's when the child moves into, you know, first walking or first standing up and experiencing the gravity in the body. And that's where actually um, children move around the age of two into this um, uh, place where they are contradicting you all the time because they first it's the first place where they experience their own weight their own, their I, it's me, that's me. So you get this stubbornness. And of course, um, gravity is very important um, in uh, diseases. So um, if you feel depressed, you feel a much higher gravity subjectively and um, dancing can hopefully also alleviate and help against this pull down to gravity. Um, so really briefly, because I don't have much time left. I really wanted to go into the relational dimension in the end of my talk. Um, so there's um, Kafka, Georg Kafka, um, who was talking about the Ur-Affekte. Basically, he conceptualized affects, basic affects in terms of relations. And he said, um, there is love and affection, and it's in terms of movement, along with me to you. So it's a pull. And then there's ingestion along with you to me, which is in desire and greed. And then there's away with me from you, which is in fear and disgust. And then there's away um, with you from me, which is in anger and hatred. Um, so anger is actually the only approach emotion where I actually go and go closer to somebody. So that's also interesting in and of itself. Um, 
And my last point I want to make um, is that um, I think our human dimension after all these spatial time and gravity dimensions is the dimension of love and attachment actually. And we're finding out at the moment that attachment styles are correlated with many, not only psychopathologies, but also really other health issues and health problems that are medical health issues and problems. We're also finding out that mirroring and movement is an embodiment of attachment so the more secure a person is attached and their attachment style, the freer this person is actually able to mirror. And um, then I had brought a movie example, which I don't go into, but I'm giving you a recommendation because there's a science fiction interstellar that is really actually beautifully talking about these dimensions and also putting the dimension of love as a bridge in the end in order to save the world, of course, because it's a Hollywood movie. But anyway, it's um, very good um, to watch because it has this thought of attachment and love being our human dimension that can actually surmount time, space and gravity and um, go beyond it. Um, where have I already read that? Where have I already read that? I've read that in a book of Varela and um, Maturana, I think. Um, who are coming to a similar point at, in their final chapter. Um, they're talking about um, love at the final stage of their dynamic systems theory of knowledge, actually. So um, going with them, I want to end with a quote. This is my last slide, Maria Isabel. I'm sorry, I'm going over time. I want to end with their quote around that. Um, biology also shows us that we can expand our cognitive domain. This arises through a novel experience brought forth through reasoning, through an encounter with a stranger, or more directly, through the expression of a biological interpersonal congruence, a biological interpersonal congruence that lets us see the other person and open up for him or her room for existence beside us. This act is called love or if we prefer a milder expression, the acceptance of the other person beside us in our daily living. And I just wanna point out that um, Hanne de Jäger is actually doing some beautiful research on the phenomenon of love from the phenomenological side at this point in time. So if you wanna check out more, go to Hanne de Jäger. And this is it. Thank you all for your attention. I'm looking forward to discuss this with you.